so much and special thanks to Wayne and everybody that contributed to this fantastic resource. Uh, I'd just like to express how grateful we are at the department for not only this amazing resource but also the ongoing support that we get from WAS as well in promoting responsible beekeeping and biosecurity in WA. So thank you so much. Okay, now we're going to quickly move on and to our presentation tonight by Sabrina Hahn. Sabrina is a highly respected horticulturalist and advocate for gardens, plants, and their many people on how to establish and problem solve in their gardens. And tonight, uh, the whole drug dealers look entirely differently and they're driving Mercedes Benz these days. Um, there's not so much excitement in the local IGA as there was 19 years ago uh, and not so many sirens going up and down the street, which is a bit sad really because it was like living in sort of live theatre at the end of every day. Uh, but what's happened is, so they were all quarter acre blocks, like all the older blocks in many of the old suburbs. They are now, where there was one house, there are now three. They remove every living thing on the block. There is not one single tree. So when you get suburbs like Willoughby that were built for returned servicemen just after the Second World War, all those trees were around 60, 70 years old. So all those old trees, gone, not a single one left. Not only have we lost canopy cover, but we have lost entire habitats. So I have crammed as many trees as I can in my garden because the birds have nothing to nest in, nothing to roost in, and a lot of their food source has gone. So if you look at a single gum tree, it's not just what flies in up the top, it's all the other things that happen in that tree. So if you have a tree with lots of bark, it will be full of lots of different insects that live just under the bark. When you see big old gum trees blossoming, there will be a gazillion bees around them. I have a massive liquid amber tree and in about, I reckon, five weeks time, I will have at least six million bees in that tree coming for the blossom. But also I have native bees in my garden because I have an incredible diversity of plant species in that little quarter acre. So I have a small house on a big block and that's the only way you get rid of your children when they finish school. <laughs> you downsize right from the word go. As Soon as you've had a child, you go, not having any more than two bedrooms. And they all have to be in the one bedroom, they're not all happy to leave at 18 <laughs> and go in a share house. It's marvellous, works really well. And then you've got a whole garden to work in. So I made a commitment to have as many different species of plants as possible because I wanted something in flower all year round. Because I want my garden to be exciting all year round. And I didn't even know I had microbats until I put an uplight underneath my big lemon-scented gum. And then I saw these, I thought it's weird for little birds to be flying around. Then I realised they were microbats. And the microbats were after all the moths and the insects that, were, that came for the light. And I went, woohoo, didn't know I had those. And then when I was doing overnights one night with Trevor Chapel at 1.30 a.m. out in the back veranda, I heard boo book owls. And they are nesting in my big old pepper tree in the very corner of the back block. I didn't know I had those. And that's like many of us. There's so much going on out there, but we don't know it's there because we do not stop and listen and observe. And that's something that Aboriginal people taught me up in the Kimberley. I work up in the Kimberley quite a lot. And one of the old girls I go out with, she basically said, shut up, you talk too much. I went, me? Never. <laughs> 
Um, and they would only tell you something if they thought it was appropriate and you needed to know that. And the rest of the time, they won't talk because there's nothing much interesting to say. Which makes me sound like I think I'm really interesting because I never shut up. But um, <laughs> it's only because I'm really passionate about things. So when you think about your own garden, it doesn't matter what it is. You must try and have something in flower all year round. If you are growing veggies, for God's sake, put flowers in there. You need those pollinators in. You know, um, who grows tomatoes? Oh, not everyone? Doesn't everyone grow tomatoes? Everyone should grow tomatoes. You can grow them in a pot. Anyway, you all will after tonight. Um, so, <laughs> so tomatoes have a very tiny flower. And European bees cannot pollinate them because they're too big, the bees, and they have the wrong buzz vibration. So things like native bees are very good pollinators for tomato plants. Bush flies, things like mango trees, the best pollinating thing for mango trees are blow flies. And when you go up to Carnarvon and up in the Kimberley, they actually hang fish racks, like dead fish, the, the, the skeleton of dead fish. They hang them in the trees to attract the blowflies because they are the most efficient pollinators for mango plants. With the new blueberries that are coming in, they found the best thing for blueberries are bushflies because of the, the buzz vibration and the size of the fly. So we look at these things as pests, but in actual fact, they're very important in the whole system of what does what. So things like mole crickets that everyone seems to complain about, don't know why. Um, magpies love them. You'll see them coming down, pulling them, literally pulling them out. If, you have a, if you've got a problem with an insect pest, don't go out and spray with systemic insecticides and pesticides. Have a look at what that insect is. Find out what it is. Then find out what its life cycle is because you need to understand the life cycle of all species to find out how they tick, what, what, what eats what, what they eat, where they live, when they breed, what their cycle, breeding cycle is. So find that out first before you go with a spray of whatever it is that people spray stuff with. Because once you take out one lot, you leave in this incredible, intricate, complex system, you take a piece of that pie out, it leaves a gap. So what happens to the species above and below in that circle? There's a fantastic app called My Pest Guide, which has been uh, made by Deeper. You, it's an app you put on your phone, you take a picture of the insect or the disease or the mushroom or whatever it is, you send it to them and then you get a reply saying what it is, what the life cycle is uh, and a bit of information about it. Don't do ants. <laughs> they get 596 million things about ants. Do not use ant killers. Most of them are completely useless. They also have uh, that the chemical in them can be absorbed through the soles of your feet and your hands. If you have pets or kids that run around the ground with no shoes on, that will be absorbed through the skin tissue. It's also not very effective. And people never, ever, 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 ever do this. They don't do this. They go. So let's pretend that this is a bottle of fungicide and there's a lot of blokes in the audience here. So you know what you guys never do? You don't do this. Oh, instructions for use. Oh, so it's only five mil per five litres. Oh, I've never read that before. You will find on the back of most packets of most things there will be instructions for use. So with ant dust, they don't say spray it liberally like it's talcum powder. 
uh-uh, they'll say put it in the little cracks. Um, and it usually, you have to understand that ants are either sugar feeders or protein feeders. Some are both because they're just greedy little buggers. Um, so find out. So what you do is you get your ant and you put it in a piece of sticky tape and then you send that off to the ag department. They will give you the, the species of ant. <coughs> I hate ants because it's the most asked question. It's like me with lemon trees and passion fruit vines. I'm not answering any lemon tree questions tonight. I wrote a book on citrus. It's 20, if you do ask a question, it'll cost you $20, but you get a book to take home <laughs> called My Little Book of Citrus. Um, so if you think, if you're, so who's on a, who here just lives in an apartment or a flat? A couple, one person. Two persons. Okay, so even if you live on an apartment or a flat, have pots and fill those pots with everything you possibly can. If you live on a, on a block where you have a front verge, ignore the one tree per verge system. It's not going to cut the mustard for urban living where we have urban infill. We need a lot more than one tree on a verge. I think I've broken every rule from the city of Melville over the last 19 years. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I have eight trees on my verge and probably about 40 other plants underneath it and people stop and look at it because it's beautiful. Well, it's full of weeds at the moment, but um, in two weeks it'll be looking beautiful. But, in, but weeds are very important. So what happens in winter, unless you've got a big biodiversity going on, what happens in winter is the weeds flourish. Take a look at what is on the flowers of the weeds. It will be your honeybees because there's not much else around. So the wild rewilding your garden is a little bit like being as lazy as you possibly can. Just let things rip. And then at the end of the flowering with the winter weeds, pull them out. Very therapeutic. If your knees are like mine, you probably need to have someone to help you get down and then pull you back up. But um, so weeds play a very important role. The weeds that have the little grass seeds play a very important role because there's a lot of birds that are actually seed eaters. They don't go for flowers and nuts and things. They actually need seed. If you've got... Um, if you've got a big house and a very small garden, it does not mean that you cannot have a really cracking ripper garden. Do the research on the plants. Probably don't go to the 19-year-old Bunnings kid that's got a really bad hangover on a Saturday morning. You may not get the most valuable information on what plants are best for your garden. Um, go to a horticulturalist, go to a nursery and say, the most important thing you have to say to them is, this is my soil type, which for 99% of the people in this room will be sandy, unless there's people here who are really posh and have beautiful loamy clay soil up in the hills. Then you guys, your biggest challenge is to actually dig a hole in the first place. <laughs> Highly recommend you get to know a bobcat driver really well that's got different size augers. Um, he will be your bestest friend ever. If you live on the coastal plain, you will have sandy, gutless, hydrophobic, really crappy soil with not a lot of stuff going on. So when you think about WA, we have the greatest diversity of plant species in Australia by far. 
Why do we have all those plants on such revolting, sandy, gutless soil? It's adaptation and evolution. So things like our grevilleas and hakeas and banksias have developed an entirely different root system to other plants that can extract the very, very, very small amounts of nutrients in the ground. It's taken them thousands of years to develop this entirely different root system. They have cluster roots. And then there's all sorts of magic that happens within the root on what they actually do with those minerals and how they uptake it and send it to the rest of the plant. So our plants are unique and exceptional because of the soil type they grow in. So if you're going to revamp your garden, take out your six iceberg roses and 30 petunia plants and decide that you want a more exciting garden. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with those plants, but have some other stuff as well. You never know, you might just get into all sorts of things. Tell the, tell the person at the nursery what your soil type is and then you have to tell them whether it's in sun or shade. And experiment. So on my front verge, I call it the killing fields because I trial stuff out there. I go, okay, let's see if you survive this. And it's usually tough, <laughs> tough conditions. And then I know that actually that one is a suitable for my place in that soil type. If you see something in a garden that's thriving in the same area, get to know that person, ask them if you can have a cutting or some seed. Grow stuff from seed. Go to the Kings Park plant sale next Sunday from, it's from 8 to 12. Saturday, sorry. Is it Saturday? Ah, oh, because I'm doing a gig there on Sunday, so I'm hoping there's one on Sunday as well. <laughs> Actually, I better check on that, come to think of it, because I'm quite busy on Saturday. Anyway, whatever day that you feel that you can go, um, because they've got all sorts of plants you will never find anywhere else, because they grow all those magnificent, very special little plants that no one else does go there, have a look. They are so knowledgeable, all the people that work there, all the friends of Kings Park who grow all the plants, incredibly knowledgeable. Do stuff like that. Have a stab at stuff. We are looking at, we are looking at a, a very rapidly changing environment and climate, a rapidly changing climate. Our, we are going to have to adapt how we grow, when we grow, what we grow, and become a lot more observant. Insects and plants have been adjusting to climate change for the last 20 years. We are the slowest species to take notice of what happens on the planet we live on. Insects will adapt much faster than anything else. And we know that because we've watched the evolution of different, how different things work out, what's the best way to survive. So we actually need to understand that all the rule books are going to be thrown out. So the way we garden and the way in which we garden, we are going to have to be a lot smarter and much faster at adapting and adjusting to climate change. We need to be putting many, many more plants. When it comes to urban infill, we need to put pressure on to say, like in my suburb, where there's been 60% loss of canopy cover because of urban infill. We need to now make the state government aware that there has to be something in place to try and replace the amount of trees that are coming out because those trees were 60, 70 years old. It's happening all through Perth. And I understand that in a growing population that we can't have the urban sprawl anymore. 
There's nothing wrong with high rise development, but it has to be balanced with the amount of free space that we can grow nature to compensate for the nature that's been, for the denature. So we will be living in high rise much, we will see a lot more high rise. But we need to be really aware, unless you want to live in a concrete desert, that we must balance that with something else. So those urban bushland blocks where they take out X amount of houses, there should be X amount of space given to green space. And not just something that's a sump in the ground has to be clever green space. Has to be a place for all those other species that used to live there. Otherwise, we will live in a desert. In the 1960s, there was a book called The Silent Spring. Did anyone read that? Yeah. So that was about the pesticides and insecticides that were being used mass um, agriculturally and all the birds were dying, particularly the little birds were dying because there's nothing for them to eat. So in an era where the most rapidly growing species is us, we need to actually start giving back to nature because if we don't, nature will conquer us eventually. And it won't be a very happy family ride, I should not think so. Even the smallest bit that we do is definitely, definitely worth it. We want to be able to take our children camping. Oh, depends if you like them or not and if they like camping. Get someone else to take them if you're not that keen on camping. Um, but we want them to experience nature because we are part of nature. And you know, the whole the whole thing with, the, with the, the whole lockdown and the COVID stuff made people really aware of how important nature is. When you are locked in your house, I, I, poor Melbourne, I feel so sorry for the people of Victoria. They must be going insane because they've been in lockdown for a very long time. But it makes you understand that we are still very connected with nature because when it's removed from us, we get very stressed and very down. The colour green is something that's inherent in our whole makeup, our whole DNA. And if anyone's gone overseas in winter and you haven't been able to look up and see the sky and see blue, it's depressing because we are used to vastness. But when you're in another country where it's overcast and the sky is there, it, it affects your whole mood. So we are very lucky to have this wonderful, spacious country to live in. But we must all work to protect it and we must all do our best efforts to keep that biodiversity, to find out, find out what is in your area. Find out if you have microbats. City of Melville has three different species of microbats. Find out what birds live in your area. It will be more than just crows and parrots. Think about giving back to, to all those things. I put an almond tree in for the black cockatoos. I don't get any almonds, but I get absolute pure joy from watching them playing in the almond tree and making a hell of a noise. Um, so think about giving back in whatever way you can. Have a crack at growing your own veggies. Then you'll understand how hard it is for growers to grow. You'll have a piece of broccoli, you'll go, shit, that just cost me $8.30 to get that one broccoli. You go, oh. I loved it. When we had the first COVID lockdown, everyone ran to the nurseries and they're going, I'm going to grow my own food and feed the family. <laughs> and 90% of those seedlings would have died in the first or second week. Because growing food is very hard. It's a tough job. You have to be at it all the time. 
So we now understand that meh, maybe it's not that easy being a grower. And I think people ended up with much greater respect for all our growers and the work that they do. And our farmers. You know, farmers get a bad rap all the time. But farming has made enormous changes in the last decade. And the whole regenerative farming movement is huge now. And there are farms that are becoming carbon neutral. So there's really good stuff that's happening out there. And in your own home garden, you do not need to use agricultural chemicals. It's your garden. It's not your livelihood. Don't use pesticides and insecticides. You have no idea what you're killing. So, you know when they had the floods over east and there was all this vision of the millions of spiders that were up on all the fences? People have got no idea how many spiders live in wherever you are. Spiders are awesome, remember? Legs off their head. But apart from that, they've got incredible headlights on the front of their head where the legs are coming out. So they'll have a, a row of lights here, <laughs> their eyeballs, and then they'll have sort of pairs of eyeballs there. I love spiders, you can tell. So in your garden, you will have probably, hopefully, at least 200 spiders. But you won't even know they're there because they're tiny. <coughs> So I had um, mites eating a hedge uh, and it was summer so I had um, solar lights up and so I had mites everywhere and then after about three weeks I noticed that the hedge was covered in spider webs. So the spiders knew that the light attracted various insects to the light and they would snavel them. But they also ate the spider mite because spiders eat spiders and mites are an arachnid. So it sorted itself out beautifully. So I was telling this story on air and then I got into trouble from some listener that said, you shouldn't have lights on in the night garden because it disrupts everything else. I said their solar lights only last for about four hours and then it goes all dark. So... Um, <laughs> So the spiders were going, oh, opportunity, let's make use of that. Birds do the same thing. Birds, will, birds are very opportunistic. So don't feed magpies mints, please, like everyone in my street does. It's very bad for them and extremely bad for the babies. If you want to feed your birds, give them some, go and get the mealworms that you can buy from uh, pet stores. Or do what I do capture things in your garden, have a call for magpies. Magpies are very friendly, so you work out what your song is to the magpie when you're going to give them food, and they will come. People think I'm quite insane and had way too much to drink, but this is a true story. They could be right on that as well. But so, so when I capture mole crickets, I have a little song, and the magpies come down because they nest in my big gum tree. Uh, which my neighbour hates because they foolishly built a bloody great big swimming pool right underneath a lemon scented gum. Uh, so I was only, they were only there for a week and they came around, knocked on the door and asked me if I'd cut that gum tree down. I said, I'd empty your pool <laughs> first because <laughs> the gum tree is not coming down. It's been there for 70 years, it's not coming down. So, yeah. Um, so, so. I just get back to that whole thing about if you've got different species of plants, then you'll have different species of all the things that take care of the garden for you. So I've been in that garden now for 19 years. I have never, ever, ever used any pesticide or herbicide because I love to go out and observe what's there. So I want you all to go home like you're a four-year-old kid with a magnifying glass, except have a glass of wine or something while you're doing it, unlike the four-year-old, uh, and just sit. Go home. Oh, no, don't do it tonight. It's bloody freezing. Um, on a lovely warm night, 
just go and sit outside quietly and listen. Put a light on something somewhere and watch what comes in. So those beautiful lace wings, the green lace wing, you know when you sit outside at night and you have your lights on, you'll see the lace wings, they've got long beautiful lacy wings. Uh, they come to the light. They are ant lions. And if you have, if you see, am I talking too long? Oh, God, yes. Sorry. Um, I'm finishing now. Um, so, so they lay their eggs horizontally on little threads so that when the eggs drop to the ground, they go into the soil, and their larvae eat ants. And then they grow into an adult and get those beautiful lacy wings, have a lot of sex and lay more eggs. And on that note, thank you very much. <laughs>Not at all. You kept us all thoroughly entertained and everybody, I was watching the audience and everybody was very engrossed. Oh, now, before I say thank you, can I, I just add for everyone that the um, Kings Park plant sale is both the Saturday the 11th oh. and the Sunday the 12th oh, of September. But you can buy some really nice things tonight. Sabrina has out the back um, three different books, one around citrus, one taking you through the months of the year, and the other one, more general stuff about gardening, really good stuff about mulch, compost, etc. Oh, back sorry. The oh, sorry. Oh, Jess is tired. Okay. You may be able to get smuggle something out. Now, look, all of our stuff is available at all the uh, independent nurseries. It is not available at Bunnings. Uh, so it's at nurseries, so all the Waldex, all the Dawson's, all the independents. Okay, some really good stuff for growing things in your garden as opposed to killing things in your garden. Um, Sabrina, we greatly appreciate your passion and the information and it's terrific having you here encouraging us because obviously bees and gardens mm. are an incredible partnership and uh, our bees can't do without the flowers. So thank Absolutely. you for all that you're doing to promote them as an ambassador for Australia's plants too. Um, and just thank you for coming here tonight. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Ooh, I wonder what's in there. And naturally there's some honey in there, oh. but there's also oh. something that for after five o'clock. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, that, that brings tonight to a close. Could I please ask you all to help stack your chairs, um, no more than 10, but no less than 10, to a um, stand. And if you could help stack them and put them away, um, that would be great. Thank you and have a good night.